When you think of Twilight, it's likely images of sparkling vampires and wild fandom. And in most of our minds, that time has well passed. But right here in the place that inspired it all, both those fans and that mythical world are still very much alive and going strong. When Stephanie Meyer was first writing Twilight, she Googled the rainiest place in the US and she found Forks. A tiny little dot on the map town in the middle of the forests of Washington state that almost nothing happens in for most of the year. Stephanie Meyer had never been to Forks when she wrote about it. She said she wanted the dreariest town on the peninsula and Forks came up. <laughs> I uh, lived in Forks for 25 years. Forks is historically known as a logging town. The logging's been slow. I've seen days it's not, nobody on the streets. Like it's a, completely like a ghost town. In the state of Washington, under a near constant cover of clouds and rain, there's a small town named Forks. Population? 3,120 people. Stephanie Meyer couldn't have known how closely she'd captured the otherworldly, small community feel of Forks. And this town wasn't prepared for how dramatically it would be changed by her sparkling vampires. People were picturing the way Stephanie Meyer described Forks in her books, and people came here and discovered that's true. People started coming to Forks because of Twilight before the first movie went out to the theaters. A small town populated by generations of loggers and used to being anonymous, Forks was resistant to this fan invasion and could make little sense of those so devoted to this made-up supernatural world. If you're an old-time logger, you're going, what's all this about? This is, this is silly. I watched uh, approximately five minutes of the first movie. I could not do it after that. I, I was done. At first, it was like, really? For a movie? Come on. But these diehards simply would not and could not be stopped. I live Twilight 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My name is Lissy Andros, and I'm the executive director of the Forks Chamber of Commerce, and I've lived in Forks, Washington since um, 2009. I read the Twilight series and saw the movies, became a big fan, fell in love with the characters. And so me and my mom moved up to Forks from Texas with 12 dogs. There really was no plan. Just the plan was to be here. When I did look for a job, I ended up working at the Forks Chamber of Commerce and was promoted to executive director in 2012. The Forks Chamber president said that when I first moved that they called me that crazy Twilight girl. Upon the release of New Moon, Stephanie came to Forks, Washington to do a book reading. She was amazed when she came to Forks and she said, this is exactly how I thought it would look. The first gathering was um, probably over 100 people, and that was in 2007. In September, every year after, there was some form of celebration. So it's ranged anywhere from a few hundred people to a few thousand people. Traffic jams occurred at our single stoplight. I mean, just hammered with Twilight fans. Okay, let's pause here because not all of you remember Twilight or let's face it, ever saw it at all. So here's the series in a nutshell. Bella is an adolescent every girl who moves in with her dad in his hometown of Forks. There she falls in love with high school hottie Edward, who is also a sparkly vampire. But Bella's best friend Jacob, who's super into her, is the vampire's mortal enemy, a werewolf. And therein lies Team Edward versus Team Jacob. Anyway, there's not much else you need to know except that Team Edward wins and marries Bella. She becomes a badass vampire herself, they have a baby, which is super dangerous for her, and they all live happily ever after. In between, there's a whole mess of warring factions of vampires and werewolves, alliances that are made and broken and lots of pining. And many, many people thought Bella was in a very controlling relationship and therefore set up a terrible example for young girls. An assertion that Twilight fans would strongly disagree with. In any event, the books launched a movie franchise, and the phenomena around Twilight became... Our generation's Beatlemania. You know, people went Beatles screaming crazy. A festival was born, attracting faithfuls who return year after year, and tryhards of all varieties. When I first got here, I thought it was all bad. Crazy. <laughs> it is crazy, right? 2013, we started coming together. Yeah, coming from Australia is my first time. It's my eighth trip to Forks, Washington. I've been coming since 2008, and he's been coming since 2012. Probably hundreds of times I've seen the movies. I live in Doha, Qatar. It only took nine and a half hours on the plane to Seattle. I quit my job, and I came. Did you need to quit your job to come? No, I didn't need to, but I wanted to. 
The other interesting thing about this event is that nothing was ever actually filmed in Forks. When the movie started coming out, People would say, well, why is everybody going to Forks? It wasn't even filmed there. The town was kind of perplexed about what was happening, but the people who worked at the chamber, they saw a need to give fans an experience, so they created the Twilight Tour and found the places that match the descriptions in the books. And then businesses started jumping on board. Um, and like one business named themselves the Treaty Line, one business created a Bella Burger and so forth. So I think the businesses have had a lot of fun with it. People were drawn to Forks, this real town shrouded in fiction-based mystery. And locals found themselves exposed to a brand of all-consuming fandom that is generally confined to cons and chat rooms. It was a culture clash in its purest form. And we even had people come and say, are there really vampires that live here? You go to Forks High School? Is Edward there? Is Bella there? They truly believe that there's people there. And we're like, yeah, they are there. We used to have one girl that come every year that had a cutout of Edward, and she sit at the table with her. And yeah. About four years ago, five years ago, we had some girls from California that had permanent fangs in their mouth for Twilight. With the vampires and Twilight don't have fangs. Fake fangs, tattoos, fan fiction, one of which would become a global phenomenon in its own right, the Twilight lovers were swept away by their passion and would go to untold lengths to express their affection, perhaps none more so than those who gather right here in Forks. In 2015, we rebranded our celebration as Forever Twilight and Forks, and we really felt like Forever Twilight and Forks more represented what the festival was because we feel like this is gonna be part of us forever. There's no convention center here. Events are hosted literally wherever they can find space, at the Elf Club, at the high school, at a wedding reception venue. They built a place just for this festival, the Rainforest Arts Center. This is their permanent collection of props and costumes and Twilight memorabilia. Creativity just burst out of people. I mean, you can see it here, people making cool quilts, people making their own awesome jewelry, designing t-shirts. I've got yeah, what is that? Right? <laughs> a shirt, uh, the Kiss yep, Me Myra shirt, <laughs> and a uh, shirt of Jacob's, a motorcycle shirt. Was that expensive? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How much was it? <laughs> Some of my favorite pieces here in my Twilight room are my neon sign. Dazzle by Twilight used to be a store here in Forks, and so Edward dazzles me. So, of course, my stand-up Edward, you know, he's watching me right now. Can you see he's looking at me? Once you get here, you find out that this is like its own culture. There is lingo and language. There is a hierarchical structure to the cosplayers. The cosplayers are maybe one of the most fascinating parts of this event because they don't function like they do at Comic-Con where there's two million Wonder Women who are also just fans. No. So when I first got here, I thought that we were just cosplayers that were here for like us to take pictures with. And I was like, oh, that's so nice. And then I went into like the birthday party thing and the guy that's Jacob was there and I was like, I think it's so nice that you guys do this. And he was like, well, I just live right over there. And I was like, you're a local? Like, wow, what's that like for you? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, I just live on the reservation with my dad and he's like in a wheelchair. And I was like, oh. <laughs> like then you're like, wait a, <laughs> wait a second. Hold on a second here. And I think that was the first time I realized just how serious this was. We are actually hired every year by the festival to bring the Twilight characters to life, so we act in an entertainment capacity for the fans. So um, we're out there interacting, mingling, taking photos, speaking to the fans as if we are the characters and drawing them into the Twilight world. I was actually one of the first to read Twilight. Um, I nannied for Stephanie Meyer's first cousin and very good friend. So I knew about Twilight before it was a thing. I was not interested until I saw Michael Sheen play Arrow. Remarkable. As soon as Michael Sheen went, what a happy surprise. Bella is alive after all. It just sent tingles like up and down my body. The two people hosting the event are cosplayers who are Aro and a second Alice. I'm also on the planning committee and every year we look at oh, what, what have we done? What can we do differently? What can we do better? So we're up at 5 a.m. every morning, headed out to our first event by 8 a.m. Wearing hair and makeup and contacts all day, performing for fans. Um, and we have to be on all the time when we're with fans. So that means no eating, no drinking, no going to the bathroom because vampires don't do that. We typically don't get home and into bed until two, three o'clock in the morning. And then we're up at 5 a.m. to do it all over again. I love how into it they are. It does bring it to life. It does make you feel like 
you're part of it. I think we have this down to a science at this point. We know our characters very well. We don't break character when we're at events. Together we work to make a conducive experience for our guests at the festival. There's really no other convention that quite captures the immersive, books come to life experience that this festival does. It's nice to have a place to go for your fandom, Harry Potter fans or Star Trek fans. There is no place that they can go, but Twilight fans can come to Forks. This is the Disneyland for Twilight fans. That's how I describe it now. It doesn't get any more extreme than going to fake Edward of Bella's wedding. Edward's definitely one of the sexier characters that a lot of people seem to fantasize about. And, you know, when they actually get to see Edward, you know, right in front of them, all dressed in character, sometimes it's a little hard not for them to, like, want to, like, touch me or, like... I've had uh, a couple of people who try to lure me into the girls' bathroom. You have these people who are dedicated enough to dress up, act like them, play the role, and like become who they're playing. I mean, I study Italian and Latin. I like to look into science and history and religion and art. Men in the 1700s, 1800s used signet rings, so I had this made. Yeah, I've spent a lot of money on costumes. I own a Scream One Caius costume, the Jamie Campbell Battle War. Last night I wore a dress she actually wore in the movie, and I won it in an auction. The hammer price was two thousand dollars. The costume that I have actually is the uh, Scream One costume from uh, the fight scene. The Cameron Bright wore this costume. I also own Jane Scream worn battle dress. This specific dress I paid three thousand dollars for. I actually worked uh, three jobs. I work at a retailer in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I could have went to school. I could have bought a car. My credit cards regret it, but at the end of the day, I mean, money can't buy this. So, you know, even if someone else doesn't get your, your why you have obsessive colon disorder, you know, there's plenty of people who do. So, yeah, we can all kind of bond over that. Somebody bought the Volvo that was used in the movie. From the dealership that we rented the Volvo from, they found like the VIN number, tracked down what person they sold that Volvo to, and then she bought the Volvo. And of course, somebody here bought Bella's house. The house um, was the, the home that was used in filming for the movie Twilight. We won't be able to do tours, unfortunately, but uh, we do plan to open it up as an Airbnb. Uh, so that people can actually stay in the home and experience the home that they've seen in the movie. You can't help but find yourself charmed by these disarming fans and also a little bit befuddled. You ask yourself, are they crazy or are we for just refusing to unapologetically love what we love? Because the truth is, as much as they've bonded here, Twilight was not universally beloved to say the very least. Do you remember when Twilight first came out? It was complete mania. Twilight! Women, mostly teen girls and moms with families, lost their damn minds. We screamed, it was awesome! And those used to owning Comic-Con found themselves pretty pissed off when they were descended upon by these new hardcore fans. When Twilight fans first arrived at Comic-Con, the hostility was palpable. So much so that one year when a Twilight fan was hit by a car outside of the convention center and killed, there were those who celebrated the tragedy as one that was earned. She deserved it, some insisted, for simply liking a thing they didn't connect with. I was on the anti-Twilight side immediately, inherently. It was almost an act of dislike, like, Twilight, you know? There was such outrage about Twilight that seemed out of proportion to any other book or movie. I mean, I've had people throw stuff at me from, like, moving cars here in Forks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We watched people leave angry, hateful reviews on these movies that they never went and saw. We saw people rag on the book and on Stephanie Meyer, but they never read the book. And it became such a trend, you know, people were like, a better love story than Twilight, you know, hashtag stupid sparkly vampires, whatever. So it became kind of a bandwagon for people to jump on. Definitely, I would say a lot of the criticisms on Twilight are unwarranted. One of the things that's always irked me is when they say Bella's weak. And she sticks to her guns. We have a tendency as a society to absolutely hate, revile, and, and, and treat with vitriol everything that has to do with teenage girls. 
We hate their music, we hate their icons, we hate their fashion, we hate their behavior, we hate everything about them. Just because you're into sparkly vampires and I'm into space wizards doesn't mean either one of us is cooler or smarter or right or wrong or anything like that. I think a lot of people are scared to open their mind to the possibility of liking something that doesn't safely fit into their view of what's good and that's that's their loss. Anybody who's sort of being like, you know, Twilight sucks or vampires that sparkle or stupid, probably has their own thing that they're into that I might think isn't so great. It's unfortunate that there was this sort of backlash, but at the same time, you can see it's not deterring fans. <laughs> you can't help but wonder if all that backlash and hate bonded them together even more closely. It sort of makes sense that people who may feel sidelined in their own lives are attracted to this story that was so maligned by culture at large. We all kind of defend each other when we kind of get attacked. I've seen it online, people attacking especially our cosplayers. They just interact with everybody and they bring it to life for us. I mean, they're our family. Why wouldn't we defend them? Being able to interact with these people that love this thing so much makes it worth it. Alice went to a wedding here not too long ago in full Alice character and was her maid of honor. I mean, we've had fans write us into their wills. Fans who are terminally ill come and every time they come they think it might be the last time they see us, so they're really emotional, but this is where they want to be before, you know, before anything happens. So we've made a lot of special connections doing this. Oh, there was one that really touched my heart last year. She posted on my social media, she said, I have very serious social anxiety and I came to Forks by myself and I was so scared to go to events. And then she said, and then I met you and then you made me feel wanted and special and you really helped me to kind of come out to different events. And I was so touched by that because I mean, I suffer from bipolar disorder, so I completely understand. The faithful that remain stay largely for each other, but what was it about Twilight initially that captured the hearts of so many so deeply? I examined it from every angle and asked myself what it was about this particular story that was causing such a massive cultural impact. When I read the books in 2008, I was kind of at a point in my life where I didn't have a lot of things I was looking forward to. I was um, a divorced woman. I, my mother had just recently separated from my, from my dad, so she had moved in with me. And um, I really wasn't feeling very fulfilled. And so I really feel like I connect to Edward in a way because Edward has been living so many years just going through the motions, not really having anything to look forward to, and, and I kind of felt like that. Anyone who's been married can tell you that marriage is not perfect. And I think that this idea of a perfect love story just attracts women who always wish they had the perfect love and young girls who've never experienced it. I've even heard of women leaving their husbands because they're like, they wanted this love that they could feel and see like in the movies and like in this book. The conclusion that I drew was that Twilight was hitting a part of the feminine fantasy that culture was largely ignoring, and that is the desire to be safe. I really believe that the most primal desire for most human beings, but especially women, is to be safe. And this story hit every single angle. One, you don't want to get cheated upon. Guess what? They can't. The werewolves are biologically compelled not to cheat on you. And the vampires, once they find their mate, they're never leaving them. Two, they're rich. You are financially safe. Three, if someone comes at you physically, Edward's gonna stop them. He's the world's best predator. But if he's not there, your best friend Jacob, who's also kind of into you, he's a werewolf and he can handle it. Eventually, when you get turned into a vampire, you're 10 times more beautiful than you ever thought you could be. And now you're a badass and you can stop anyone. That was literally a human shield. There is no part of this story that leaves you feeling unsafe. And on top of that, in the end, there's no sacrifice. She's got a kid, shouldn't be able to do that. She's got a family, she's still got her dad, she's still got her friends. Literally everything works out for her. So who wouldn't want to immerse themselves in that particular fantasy? I don't want anybody else but an Edward Cullen. So. Yeah, like I will not accept anything lower than an Edward Cullen. Like <laughs> someone who will respect and love me as much as Edward loves Bella. Realistically, you can't say, oh, I, I want a man just like Edward, you know? Because to me, you know, He's a fictional character, and I love Edward, but he's good in two-dimensional form. You know? <laughs> but I, I don't think that I'm gonna say, oh, I want my boyfriend to treat me just like Edward treats Bella, because, you know, my boyfriend's a man and Edward's a vampire, so. <laughs> I see that very clearly, so. I mean, a vampire should not sparkle. Come on, let's be realistic. There's a lot of things that are ridiculous about it, but it's gotten me through 
cancer. It's got me through all kinds of things in my life and brought so many different things. It's brought me out of my shell. A lot of the people that we've met here have been coming for fun. People that just need a break, want to create a coven with their girlfriends. But we've also heard a lot of pain. I have some social anxiety really bad and I cannot talk to people, but Twilight has brought me in and we're all like a family. Okay. Okay. We've had fans that have come from bad home lives, who have gone through difficult situations, illnesses, divorces. Coming here just seems to have become their happy place and yeah. interacting with us, you know, in many cases has given them the family that maybe they don't have at home. About two years ago, all of my grandparents passed away within three months of each other. And it was such a hard time to be around my family and interact with them because they needed help and I needed help and we couldn't really help each other because we were not in a good place. And so escaping into a book, especially Twilight, when there's immortality and they live forever, it, it works so well. Any day at the visitor center, you could get someone in there that says that Twilight changed their life. Twilight's given me like direction and purpose. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying you know I'd be on the you know living on the streets, but I don't know what direction my life would have taken. You know, I've been to Volterra, Italy. I never ever would have had the courage to travel overseas had I not met the friends I have through Twilight. I met Chandra back in 2014, I believe. She's become one of my best friends. <laughs> I love her so much. That, that relationship wouldn't have happened without Twilight. Honestly, I just met all of these people just yesterday. <laughs> and it already feels like they're my family. I've lived here for six years, but I've never felt so welcome in this town until now. I came up here two years ago on a work trip to like sell things that I didn't really care that much about. I was talking to a, a young woman from Hawaii. We ended up walking around the city, and when I say city, I mean the one street that sure. Forks is. It's a very small town. And then I left like fully 100% in love with this girl that I had met, and it was completely insane. And now she's moved to California, and we live in LA together. Through my experience with this festival in particular, and interacting with the fans of Twilight, I very quickly changed my perspective on what fandom is. There's a lot of ridiculous posturing among nerds. And why, why would we? We're, we're nerds anyway. Is it make more sense to embrace the thing that you love full throttle versus you not? You should. You should. Like, my parents still are like, why are you still doing that? I'm like, I love it. And if you got a problem with that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for Everybody out there, I'm doing it for myself. A photographer captured the moment I met Stephanie Meyer. That's one of my treasures. Because of that woman, my life changed so much, and so did thousands of other people's lives. This festival created a safe place for fans who felt so misunderstood elsewhere. But what no one could have seen coming is that their love of sparkling vampires would save the town, too. Forks was in a recession. 2007, 2008, things were really going downhill nationwide. The government is trying to regulate the timber industry out of existence. And the same with the fishing industry. I remember forks before the recession and literally seeing people nail up boards onto doors and windows and how scary it was for me and just the kids of my age seeing their parents either losing their jobs or slowly boarding up what they had and then Twilight came, and then all of a sudden we had this new surge of economy included with our ecotourism. We're actually one of four rural towns in Washington State that didn't go under during the recession. The more and more people came, and the more that they filled restaurants and filled the motels, many of the people in Forks, including uh, the mayor and uh, the chief of police, began embracing and realizing, you know, this is a real economic boost for Forks. It's, it's been great because it's brought in a lot of people into town. They come in for twilight, but then they realize how gorgeous the whole area is, and so they come back. And then they go tell their friends, and they come back. The town found itself forever changed by the phenomenon around twilight. I always say that I am a fan of the fans. Twilight saved their economy at the end of the day. I can't imagine what the last nine years would have been like had I not discovered the Twilight Saga and made this change. I'm just forever grateful for Twilight. 
How long do you think that this will last here in Forks, the Twilight Festival? Oh, I don't think it's going to go away. This year, actually, more people are at the festival than last year. Their mothers that are Twilight fans are going to have their daughters read these books. If you told me while I was reading Twilight in the eighth grade that this would be such a huge part of my life, I would have never believed you. I would have laughed at you and said, how? I said, it's just a story. Nobody else is going to read it. And then it became what it is today. And this community has been absolutely amazing. And I've met amazing people from all around the world. There's so much more to these people than just liking Twilight. And I'm grateful that Twilight taught me that. You know, I think about Twilight and I think of the fans and the people I've met through Twilight. So Twilight to me is not just the books or the movie or the story. Twilight to me is this, this family we've created.